Hi, good afternoon, everybody. This is Eric with American Business Systems. Certainly want to welcome you here this afternoon. It is a, a great pleasure to have everybody here. And actually, it's an, it's an exciting time because uh, not only are we going to have Patrick Phillips, our CEO of American Business Systems, on this afternoon, but he's actually going to be interviewing uh, Dr. Vicki Rackner. So this is an exciting uh, Wednesday webinar, as you can see here, how to start a successful business by helping doctors thrive. I mean, folks, if uh, as you will go through and pay attention today, uh, you're going to get a lot of information as we go through uh, this afternoon. So uh, if you do me a favor, for some of you already know about this, I'm going to make sure that we're being heard. So if you will go over to your little question box area and just type in your city and state, uh, we are ready to go. And I'm going to start calling out some names here just very briefly. And uh, so we've got uh, Andrea, you've got, got you here from North Carolina. So good to see you. And uh, Jed, it looks like got you from uh, Templeton, California. Uh, Rashawn from uh, Houston, Texas. We've got Mike uh, from Fayetteville, North Carolina. Got a couple of people here from North Carolina. Jackie, good to see you this afternoon from Santa uh, Margarita, California. So good to see everybody here. Uh, there are a few people else that are on here that uh, you're just not, maybe you're a little shy of putting that in there, but uh, go ahead and do that. We will certainly uh, keep up with you. If you uh, know that it may be in your uh, handouts there, we'll make sure that we get a handout to you uh, as we go through here. But as I start to introduce to you our CEO, uh, who is Patrick Phillips, I want to let you know that he's written some books. Uh, the one there in the very middle, you see that he's written with Dr. Vicki Rackner. He and Dr. Rackner actually are working on a new book, and hopefully they'll be able to talk about that this afternoon. But not only is he an author of these books, he's also been featured in a, in a magazine called the Billing and Coding uh, Magazine. It's called BC Advantage uh, that I'm hopefully being able to click right there. There we go. Uh, he actually had a new article that just came out here recently uh, that uh, has shown up in one of these, in these, and it's all about helping doctors get their money. And so really that's what, one of the things that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, folks, one of the things that we do here is to certify you as a certified medical revenue manager. And that's from this organization called MRMA. That's the Medical Revenue Management Association of America. So all of our certifications are, 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 are managed by them and make sure everything goes along. And, and uh, I know that Dr. Brackner and, and Patrick are going to be uh, discussing that. As you do your due diligence, obviously you want to be dealing with somebody that's been around for at least uh, more than two weeks. <laughs> uh, we're actually going on 24 and a half years. It's, it's so, so mind boggling to know that within a short six months, we'll be celebrating 25 years. So that is a, an incredible uh, achievement here uh, for Patrick Phillips uh, here and ABS. Obviously, what gets us to the level of what we're able to do is through our web-based platform, which is, I claim, an EMRX. Uh, it is a web-based platform, but as you'll maybe get to hear today, it's very specific because just think of it, folks, we're going we can actually take claims directly from the iClaim system all the way to the insurance company. And that is very, very unique. So you can see that we have a total outsourcing advantage when we have all components working together. These aren't pieces of software that we've put together and hopefully they work. It's one software that has four major different components here. Uh, as you can see here that we've got a new training class that's going to be coming up here very shortly. Uh, that is here in uh, just basically a two and a half weeks away. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that as we kind of go through that. And there is uh, at the end of that training workshop, again, there is the certification that we're going to uh, give to you for every participant uh, that is in our training workshop. Well, folks, without any further ado, I'm going to go ahead and bring Patrick Phillips on, and I know he's going to introduce some of the books that he's working on with Dr. Racker. Patrick, it's good to see you here this afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. We're our, our names are both American Business Systems. See if they're at the bottom of our picture. <laughs> <laughs> <Sure is. laughs> 
<laughs> well, Eric, thank you for that wonderful introduction. We've got a lot to cover here today. So folks, again, welcome to everybody. I see more people putting their name and their city and state in there. I forget where we left off there, but Jonathan is from uh, Sacramento. Monica's from Boston. Ron is from uh, Tulsa. Randolph is from Vincent. I mean, from Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all for joining us today. Uh, yeah, we've got some uh, really exciting stuff here to cover today. So let me get back to uh, a couple of slides here. When you graduate from our live training workshop, by the way, you'll get this certificate. This is what uh, the uh, Medical Revenue Management Association of America issues and certifies all of our trainees that go through our class here in Dallas. We're the only organization that can claim that we're the nation's largest network of independent certified medical revenue managers. And so, uh, okay, well, now let me get to our guest today. Our guest is Dr. Vicki Ragnar. She's a retired general surgeon, and she has been on all sorts of TV, radio, magazines, uh, newspapers. She is all over the place. She's written about a dozen books. Here's some of them that you can find out there on Amazon.com. Her latest one is The Myth of the Rich Doctor. Doctor, what is the state of your financial health? This is a wonderful book. She is speaking all over the country about this. And we'll talk a little bit later in the webinar today about a new book that she and I are writing called Nine Ways Physicians in Private Practice Let Money Slip Through Their Fingers. Now, folks, this is the most unbelievable marketing tool you could ever ask for. We're going to talk about it a little bit later in more detail, but just stay tuned because this is a this is going to be a great one. And you guys are seeing it before it's even uh, published, but it'll be out in about 30, 45 days. Uh, Dr. Ragnar is also a contributing editor of the Physicians Money Digest, and she is also on the board as our medical director for Medical Revenue Management Association of America. So let's welcome Dr. Vicki Ragnar, and she's live here from Minneapolis. Well, well thank you, Patrick. It's a delight to be with you today. Thank you. She's actually just joining us here by uh, via telephone uh, because we have, well, she's just busy. She's all over the place and she's busy. So Vicki and I are going to try to go through some information today that I think will be valuable to you guys. Hey, think about this. You have right here live on this webinar today with me, a medical doctor. Now she's retired at this point because she got wealthy she got lazy. She got. Uh, she didn't like traveling as much all over the world, and she's decided to help people like ourselves and you folks uh, to to connect with doctors and folks to have a doctor who's been there, done that, and you know has the t-shirt, so to speak, uh, as a partner with you in this business. Well, we'll get into that a little bit more later here in the webinar. But Dr. Vicky, let me just start by uh, saying this. <clears throat> We, we titled this How to Start a Successful Business by Helping Doctors Thrive. Uh, so I want to talk to you just a little bit and let you comment on an article that I found uh, from Medscape magazine on the national physician burnout and depression. Who knew? Right. Well, I <laughs> that was very funny the way you introduced me, Patrick. My, <laughs> my calling in life is to make a positive difference. You know, I see pain and I want to alleviate it. And it was an honor and a privilege to be able to work with tens of thousands of patients. I primarily dealt with women with breast cancer and men. About 1% of breast cancer patients are men. Um, but what I felt called to do um, at about, in about 2000 was, was really to alleviate a different kind of pain. It was the pain of doctors and patients not connecting as well as they should. And when 2008 started rolling around and managed care started rolling around, what I saw was an awful lot of doctors suffering. By then, I had sort of learned some basic business skills. I realized uh, through, the, through the School of Hard Knocks how little I knew about business, and I saw how I literally paid the price for that. But sort of once I got those skills under my belt, I thought, you know what, I bet that I could help more doctors achieve the personal and professional and financial goals that attracted them to a career in medicine. So you probably know that doctors pay a big price for the privilege, and I really mean that, the privilege of being able to be there for patients in the way that they are. Like, I used to go to my practice. And I often would think, you know what, 
I would do this for free. I'm having so much fun. And I've actually done some volunteer work um, with various people. But in order to get there, doctors and their families sacrifice a lot. Like, I remember when my husband and I would go to dinner parties or the movies, this was before DVRs, we used to take two cars to a movie in case my beeper went off and I had to go to the ER. So it's sort of like, first I was married to my occupation, then I was married to my husband. <laughs> so they, they make great sacrifices in order to get this privilege. But what's happening lately is it's getting harder and harder for doctors to experience the joy of medicine. And there's a whole bunch of reasons. Um, many of these reasons are financial. And we've known that doctors are unhappy. But this Medscape study actually surveyed lots and lots of doctors. And they came up with this pretty surprising result. About 40% of doctors are burned out or have experienced burnout in the last year. And burnout is just pathologic stress. Like a little stress is good, it makes you a little better. But if you get too stressed, it impairs performance. And there are doctors out there who are so stressed by finances and compliance and the electronic medical record and the numbers of patients that they are forced to see in a day that it's sort of like they've gotten to the point where it, there's just no joy in it anymore. Now, I'm of the generation that I knew I wanted to be in private practice. I knew I didn't want to be anyone's employee. And when I got out of my residency, about 80% of doctors felt the same way. Well, as it became more challenging to generate a reasonable income, and there's lots of reasons for that that I'd be happy to talk about, Patrick, but a lot of doctors decided, you know what, I, I just can't do this anymore. I don't have the business skills. I'm just going to sell my practice to a hospital or a clinic and let this be their worry. But if you don't want to be an employee, that really is selling out. And there's a price to selling out, like you lose your voice. Um, so just as an example, I was the health and wellness expert for a uh, family-owned drugstore chain called Bartell Drugs in Washington State. And they were awesome. They wanted to educate the Seattle population. And I said, well, what if I go around and I interview doctors that were doing sort of cutting-edge research, like research in diabetes? And I, um, I identified a couple of medical conditions. They said, sure. One of them was about sleep, because sleep is like this huge problem. So I went to one of my buddies who's just a great sleep medicine doctor and I said, hey, you know, would you be um, interested in being interviewed? And um, he said, you know, I would love to do it. I'd be happy to do it. I would have said yes to you in a heartbeat, but you know, I just sold my practice. And so I'm gonna have to run this up the flagpole. And I thought to myself, this guy has like literally lost his voice by selling his practice. Like he couldn't even decide that he wanted to do an interview, which is of course the opportunity to get more patients. Um, and so most doctors, they want to be autonomous. They want to retain their voice. And, and so the big challenge right now is how do they do it? Um, when doctors were asked, you know, what contributed to burnout, what could help with the burnout? I looked at this and because I'm on the board for Myrma, I just had to sort of smile for myself because it's like, okay, um, getting a licensee, having a doctor get a licensee on board um, and using their services is the solution to almost every single contributing factor to this problem. So this is kind of a magical time. You're sort of at the right time and the right place with the right solution to help lots and lots of doctors thrive. And that is why it is such an honor and pleasure to support the ABS licensees and to support Patrick and the whole team. Um, I know that when ABS licensees are successful, that means that there's another doctor that's successful and able to stay in private practice and generating more income so they don't have to worry about retirement 
in making contributions to their community, to the art museum or to the symphony, giving more people jobs and helping the economy get back on its feet. So this, this is a win all around. And Patrick, it's just a delight working with your organization. Well, thank you, Dr. Wagner. And, and we feel very privileged to have uh, run across you out there on the internet. Do uh, you mind if I give out your website address just so people can, you know, if they want to go check you out, they certainly can. Uh, you've been out there helping doctors, helping, I should say, other stakeholders like financial planners and uh, so forth, actually connect with doctors uh, for years now. Uh, that's where you started out. Now you're, of course, working with us directly, as, exclusively with our licensees to help them know how do you get in front of a doctor? I think that's the biggest the biggest question in everybody's mind on here today uh, is that. And so what I thought I'd do is just boil it down to three questions here for you, Dr. Ragnar, uh, that I'd like to touch on. What, what are the doctor's realities out there? You've kind of touched on that some here. Also, specifically, what is their financial pain? And then what are some of the opportunities for you? So let's start with that first one, Dr. Ragnar. Uh, what are some of the realities that are facing doctors out there uh, as far as doing the the billing in-house versus outsourcing? Can we kind of talk about that just for a second? You bet. Okay, so when I went into practice, I originally joined a partner, and then I had an opportunity. There was this multidisciplinary breast clinic that was starting at another hospital where I took call. So um, I sort of um, set up my own practice. And this other guy had had this office manager he'd had for like 20 years. She went on vacation and um, his wife said, oh, why hire somebody? I can do the billing. How hard can it be? <laughs> and, <laughs> and Famous like, last words. <laughs> oh, right, exactly. And like when we weren't getting our money, we saw how hard it could be. By the way, we also, um, during the same time, hired this temp and we thought that she was just completely awesome. She was so nice. She would go out to the waiting room and help the little ladies fill out the paperwork. Well, um, we got a call from the temp agency a while later saying that they had just discovered that this woman was a convicted Medicare felon. So she was probably uh. out collecting the personal information so that she could scam people. And like, the thing is that doctors are easy financial for everyone wants to take advantage of them. So um, there are lots of people doing bad things. So I knew I wanted to outsource my billing. And that was one of the single best choices that I made. So doctors' financial realities, everyone wants to work with the rich doctors. You know, in the world of nature, there's either predators or prey. And doctors are pretty easy financial prey. Like I personally have lost hundreds of thousands of dollars in dumb doctor deals just by like trusting the wrong people. <laughs> and, and the thing is, why are you laughing, Patrick? I, laughing well, at? I've heard you use that term before, but it never ceases to uh, get a giggle out of me. Uh, dumb doctor deals. Is that what you call them? <laughs> yep. DDDs, dumb doctor deals. <laughs> So in other words, you're saying that it's so prevalent out there that doctors invest in dumb deals that there's actually a, a little phrase that they use for it. Okay, well, that, that kind of fits in with what I ask uh, the classes. I tell people at the class, you know, hey, how many of you have worked for a doctor? And if some have, they raise their hands. How many would you agree that the doctors are not the, the sharpest uh, business uh, people out there? And they all raise their hands because that's not what they went to college for. You didn't go to college to be a business person. You wanted to, you know, help, help patients. So, well, well anyway. Absolutely. And, and let me just get to that, Patrick. So I'm going to sort of skip to the content on slide 32. Yeah. Um, what I discovered the hard way is that <laughs> the world is sort of divided into two kinds of people. I call them suits and white coats. Suits and so, white coats. Um, okay. Suits and white coats. So either you're business minded or you're clinical minded. And um, and the world is a very different place. And I will tell every person that's on this webinar right now, even though you might not know anything about medical billing, you know more about how to build a successful business than doctors do. So please don't feel intimidated by doctors. 
because you have so much to offer them. Um, so let me just like talk with you about how and why the, seeing the world is so important. So we know that everyone wants to be successful. And the biggest difference between a suit and a white coat is the metric by which they measure success. So suits, you know, when, when you become an ABS licensee, um, how are you going to assess how successful your practice is? Well, you're going to look at your profitability because ultimately that's the metric by which business-minded people measure success. That's not the case for doctors. Um, I'm just working on an article putting the finishing touches for the Journal of Medical Practice Management. The title of the article is, Is Profit a Four-Letter Word? So, you know, if you were in the doctor's dining room, you know, you wouldn't hear a doctor say, hey, things are going great for me. You know, profits are up 20%. I mean, that person will be laughed out of the hospital. You know, they don't want to be perceived as somebody who's in it for the money. The metric for success for doctors is clinical outcomes. Well, boy, my patient volumes are up 20%. Man, I am so pleased with myself because, you know, I am seeing, you know, really great changes in patient outcomes. That's what they care about, clinical outcomes. So suits are all about financial outcomes. White coats are all about business outcomes. Well, if you want to be successful, you make investments in skills that help you get there. So suits invest in finance and marketing and sales skills, where a white coats invest in clinical skills. And I will tell you that nowhere in medical school or residency, and you know, the training is pretty long. So I went to four years of college and four years of medical school and five years of residency training. So I was about 70 when I got out and started practicing. But nowhere along this course, even though I borrowed about $100,000 to go to medical school, did anyone talk about money? Huh. And so just this idea about like looking at profitability, looking at cash flow, like this is really basic stuff. When doctors are managing critically ill patients, there's this sheet called the I's and O's, what goes in and out of each patient. And you wouldn't dream of managing a patient without knowing their I's and O's. Yet they just sort of go blindly in their private practice not knowing how cash flows in and out of their practice because that's not where their focus is. It's not that they're bad people. It's just not where their focus is. They don't have the skills to do it. So it's not real surprising to, you know, go into a doctor's office and find unmitigated financial disasters. It's sort of like, how can these smart doctors be making these stupid business choices and there are doctors out there who will file for bankruptcy now there's good doctors out there who you know have some sense of business mindedness and they've made some very prudent investments but if you look at doctors you know according to the u.s department of labor statistics nine out of the top 10 earners in the u.s call themselves doctors yet half of doctors are behind in retirement planning so, you know, yeah, they, they bill a lot, but do they collect it? Well, they leave about 30% of their income on the exam table by not following up on rejected insurance claims. And they have a really hard time translating their income into true wealth, into true financial freedom. And I don't know if you've ever had this experience in your life, but when you're worried about money, it's hard to think about pretty much anything else. Yeah. So when a doctor is worried about paying their bills, they're not thinking about patients in the way that they should be. <clears throat> uh, Vicki, let me let me kind of focus everybody on what you just said there because it's so important that they grasp, you know, this this relationship between doctors and and money and knowing what they really spend. Because if if I've asked doctors, what what do you think it costs you to process a, an insurance claim here in your office? And usually they'll just say something off the top of their head, like, uh, I don't know, two or three dollars, because they really don't think through what those hidden costs are. Now, this chart that I have up here, for example, uh, Dr. Vicki, is, is actually the one that, that, that we compared 
what is spent inside the doctor's office, that's in-house there, the first column, to what the doctor would spend outsourcing. Now, uh, Dr. Vicky pointed out something to me. We, we, we've been using this chart now, Dr. Vicky, for probably four or five years, but we're basically telling people that if you want to estimate what a typical uh, general practitioner spends in their own office doing their billing, then just take 20 claims uh, you know, per, per work day times five days a week times at about $100 a claim. Now, Dr. Vicky pointed out to me that that's not necessarily the type of doctor that you want to sign up. I mean, maybe initially you could start with one that has $100 claims, but Dr. Vicky, you some of your claims as a, as a surgeon were probably a little higher than that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the specialist, the ologist, the cardiologist, um, the anesthesiologist, you know, the average bill might be $10,000. Yeah, $10,000 for one, uh, one procedure, basically, right? So Correct. that means that if you're charging that doctor, we're showing here 6%, that's, you know, just an average. I mean, people charge 7 8%, some of them. Uh, I have heard them low as 5%. But anyway, let's take that 6% figure. At $100 a claim, that's $31,200 if you do the math, you know, over uh, 52 weeks. But they also are paying uh, full-time billing employees. Uh, I've got one and a half of them here <laughs> listed. Uh, so at $15 an hour, that's $46,000 right there. Then you take the payroll taxes, a worker's comp. Uh, now, Dr. Vicky pointed out to me too, we ought to change this on this chart, I guess, Dr. Vicky, because she pointed out errors and omissions insurance is something that all doctors carry. And uh, you know I've got their $300 a year for that, but it, it could vary on depending on the size of the practice. But that probably ought to be over there in the right column as well, shouldn't it? That three hundred dollars. Yeah. Uh -huh. Anyway, even if you add that in, you're you're only at thirty one thousand five hundred dollars. And of course, there's other ch costs there that the doctor has too that's hidden. But uh, yeah, it's forty eight percent less expensive for them just to pay you six percent to to bring in the money for them, and not even have yeah, to worry. Yeah, here's something else that's not on this chart, Patrick. So I have a friend of mine, she like disappeared off the face of the earth. You know, what happened to her? Well, it turns out that her office manager embezzled her entire retirement portfolio and like it was gone, it's gone. And oh. um, she that precipitated a clinical depression. And so doctors know that they are vulnerable to theft and fraud and embezzlement. So putting checks and balances in order, you know, making sure that everyone is staying honest is really important. The other thing about having somebody in-house doing it is, I can tell you from running my own practice, something always comes up and patient care is gonna trump everything else. So if there's some patient care thing that's coming up, who wants to deal with the rejected insurance claim? That goes like to the bottom of the to-do list. And then <laughs> yeah. nobody ever gets to it. And doctor, like literally doctors can walk away from 20, 30% of their revenue just because nobody likes doing it. It's not, you know, it's not what they're really there for. It's just kind of something that they've got to do. Then everyone pays the price. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's it's like those little hidden costs that we have here in this chart. Some doctors would probably not even think about the fact that they have to spend ongoing training costs, even for their current uh, employees, but especially if they have turnover, which most of them have a lot of turnover too. So, uh, And then you got employee benefits and you got all the hardware and software and IT support, which, you know, the doctor might have that cost too, uh, because he's got to have computers, of course, but he's not going to have all the expenses of the software upgrades and updates and all that hidden cost there. So folks, if we, if our figures are off here, even, you know, uh, half of what there should be here uh, for the doctor's outsourcing costs, still it's a lot of money saved uh, for a doctor that they, they don't have to spend. So this is just one of those costs that, you know, we can help with. Uh, Dr. Vicky, I think I have another question uh, for you here. Let me put this on the screen. Here's the second question we talked about. What are some of the financial pains facing doctors? That's, uh, let's see, we're on slide 40 there. So can you kind of comment on some of the things there that doctors are, you know, actually under pressure uh, about that we don't even think about probably? Absolutely. So the biggest thing I hear doctors complaining about these days is the electronic medical record. 
Um, they sort of feel like they're being forced to have a relationship with the computer rather than the patients. They just want to see patients. Um, so I, I remember my mom was in the ICU, and the way the ICU was designed was that the screen for the computer um, was against the wall. So when the nurse was looking at the computer, her back was to my mother, the patient. And so it's sort of like literally this is getting in the way of things. And there are just, there are all of these administrative burdens. Um, some of them came from the Affordable Care Act, you know, building the infrastructure to deliver uh, cost-effective practice. So like in New York, just as a little example, um, you have to order your vaccines from the state. The state requires like six sets of paperwork. So one group of pediatricians said, man, I'm gonna have to just like hire a full-time employee just to get vaccines out. Um, staff um, retention is a problem. Um, liability, theft, and fraud is just huge. This is something every doctor worries about. We talked about the epidemic of burnout. And um, so what, what's happening is doctors are sort of feeling like they're having to see more and more patients just to keep from getting behind financially. And like, you know, there's only, you can only go so fast on the hamster wheel. It's just like, you can only do so much. And then another thing that doctors really worry about are these payer audits. So um, when I first started in my practice, um, nobody knew how much money Medicare was reimbursing me. Um, but there, part of the Affordable Care Act legislation was this Freedom of Information Act. And so the amount of money that Medicare pays to individual doctors was for the first time publicly disclosed. And what they discovered was that about 80% of the Medicare dollars were flowing to about 20% of the doctors. What is the conclusion? Well, these doctors are billing fraudulently, so let's go after them. And there's uh, actually a new task force for Medicare fraud now. Now, if you come under scrutiny from Medicare or your state medical association, um, it's not like they give you the benefit of the doubt. You are assumed guilty unless and until you can prove yourself innocent and proving yourself innocent is a huge thing. This is an absolute nightmare that doctors want to avoid. So like if you think about an IRS audit, the pain of that, multiply that by 100, and this is the kind of pain that doctors fear with a payer's audit. And, and some innocent mistakes can get you into trouble. So you know, knowing what to avoid so you don't come under that kind of scrutiny has true value to doctors. Yes. And that's one of the things, of course, our licensees can help them with. Well, we try to every problem that we run across in a doctor's office for the last 25 years, we've we try to come up with a solution from a technological standpoint to help the doctor with that particular cash flow leak or, uh, you know, problem that they're having there in, in their office. Dr. Ragnar, I'm going to um, just point out to the fact that I did put that chart that we were showing earlier comparing the outsourced cost to the insource cost in the handout section of the go to webinar control panel i also put our slides that we're showing here today in there as well if people want to go uh, download those now let's see linda's asking if we uh, have a replay since i have to leave yes we will send an email to everybody on the webinar today with the link to the replay of the webinar dr ragnar third question here for you uh, this is slide 42. What what are some of the opportunities for me? And uh, let's start with that quote from you on slide 43 there. I love that. The physician's pain is your opportunity. Tell us what that means to our listeners today. Right. So as I described, there's a lot of doctors in private practice who want to stay in private practice, but it's enough already. Enough with the headaches, enough with the rejected claims. They're thinking, is it time to sell out? Is it time to just, you know, go work at McDonald's? Not, not that bad. But, um, and you can be the person who helps the doctor see his or her way clear to staying in private practice. 
So doctors have a very unusual relationship with money. And you're going to be surprised when you meet doctors and reveal their financial truth. In fact, Patrick, what about if I give the people on this line a little gift? How about if you let them download a digital copy of The Myth of the Rich Doctors so that they can read on their own and get a little more insight about doctors and their relationship with money? Oh, sure. Um, yeah, I, I'll be glad to. Let me, I'm going to go get that while I put the picture of the book here up on the screen uh, and you can tell a little bit more about that. Yeah. Okay. So doctors have this dysfunctional relationship with money and um, that means that they're not making really good business choices. So if you can come in and help them tidy up the business side of their medical practice, that will help them sort of return to the real joy that attracted them to a career in medicine. That'll help them take better care of more patients. So I think that, you know, this model of outsourcing medical billing is just a brilliant opportunity. Um, it always has been, but it's even more attractive right now at this point when doctors are having so much financial pain. But one, one of the things about um, ABS is that you not only learn how to do the billing, but you, you have the tools to build a successful practice. And what we know, I, I've actually got these 10 laws of physician engagement. Um, I teach a whole course for ABS licensees about how to acquire more doctor clients. That's in addition to the training um, that you get in Dallas. But um, one of my 10 laws of physician engagement is that the most influential person in a doctor's life is another doctor. So like when I started my second practice and broke out on my own, and I decided I wanted to outsource my billing, how did I find that person? Well, I went to my buddy and said, hey, who does your billing? Do you like this person? Oh, here's her name. She does a great job. I'd done my due diligence. As far as I was concerned, I'd chosen my biller. So doctors influence doctors. And one of the things that I'm here to do is sort of uh, be by the side of ABS licensees opening doors for you. So I've drafted a sort of a letter of introduction so that you could potentially send it to your doctor prospect and have it be like a peer-to-peer -peer communication. You have all sorts of marketing tools that you can use. Um, there are books that Patrick and I have written that you can actually give to prospects. And the reason that this works so well is that it activates the law of reciprocity. You know, I do something nice for you, you do something nice for me. I mean, the pharmaceutical industry knows this. Um, they spend about half of their marketing budget on gifts and trinkets to give to doctors. They do it because it works. So you'll get the training about how to engage doctors, You'll have access to lots of marketing tools, but you'll also have access to me. And um, I don't know many medical revenue managers who sort of have a doctor on their team to help open what are traditionally closed doors. Well, I can I can tell you, believe me, I I know uh, our competition pretty well. I know other people who've been in this industry who've been in the industry, they got out of the industry. There there are a lot of companies that come and go. We've been doing this for 25 years, Dr. Vicki, and one of the reasons is because we as a company are focused on helping our licensees succeed and make money. The reason for that is not that we're not nice guys, we are, but on the back end, our company makes money on all of those services that are offered to the doctors. Those are paid to us directly from our partners, our technology partners who've developed some of the systems that we use. But the point is that we're the only company I know of that has connected with a doctor who is, you know, also working with uh, people all across the country to help those doctors and those people connect. And here, folks, you're seeing a letter that we've put together specifically for uh, you to have your name, your company name, associated with Dr. Vicki Ragnar. So when you come to our live training workshop, 
usually Dr. Vicki is available wherever she's at in the country and she'll pop in on us there uh, via go-to meeting and we'll introduce her to you. You'll, you'll at that point basically become partners with her in reaching those doctors that are in your community. Because believe me, I, I know Dr. Vicki's heart and her entire life is centered around helping other doctors uh, to, to thrive in medical practice. And that's so rare to have that. So anyway, uh, I don't know of any people that would connect you with a doctor. That's worth, uh, you know, the whole license fee that you'd pay us right there. But in addition to that, she's also written a book called, with yours truly, The New Thriving Medical Practice. Now, if you haven't got a copy of this, you can ask the person who sent you this webinar uh, to, to give you a copy. We did drop that myth book, by the way, The Myth of the Rich Doctor, in the handout section so you can go get that right now from us over there in the control panel for go to webinar anyway look at this one now this one i'm going to zoom in here so you can see this a little bit better because what we've done is we've uh, taken this book and we we published it out there it's on amazon you can go find it it's uh i don't know what we price this at dr biggie 20 24 about 25 dollars right? yeah and so what we did was we uh came up with a way for you to be associated with dr vicky ragnar on the book itself. So as you notice, it says the forward by Susan Smith. Now that would be your name and you'll be on there as a CMRM, that's a Certified Medical Revenue Manager, uh, once you complete our training. And we'll be able to provide these books to you with your name on the cover. But we didn't stop there. We put it on the inside page there and as a part of the forward that we've already written that you basically put your name to, uh, that's uh, that's your contact information there at the end of the of the forward. So it's a real generic forward. You can use it or you can write your own if you wanted to. As, uh, so anyway, the point is, guys, that here is another tool that Dr. Vicki came up with that I thought was just ingenious. Well, here is why this is so important. Nobody throws away books. So, you know, if you invest in a four color brochure and hopefully you're not going to that often goes in the circular file but people just do not throw away books plus once your name is on the cover of a book you've got expert positioning doctors are going to see you differently um so you're sort of different from the outside and you feel different like once your name is on the title of a book like it's it's pretty exciting you see yourself differently yeah, you do. Uh, there's something about, uh, not that you're an author necessarily, but you are uh, at least connected to a, a medical doctor. And they may not know who I am. They can read a little blurb on the back of the book and find out. But the point is that you will not have another opportunity, folks, that I believe in your entire lifetime to find a doctor who would be willing to let you put your name on the cover of a book with her and give you an introductory letter. So those are very valuable tools. Now, let's talk about our latest book, Dr. Vicki. Uh, tell me about your thinking. You came up with the idea. What, what's your thinking about the nine ways? All right. So, um, you know, smart doctors make stupid financial choices that can literally cost them millions of dollars. So Patrick and I together have nine ways that doctors let money slip through their fingers and um, a lot of these ways are um, through management of the revenue in their practice. So, you know, if you go into this book, you will find a prescription to outsource your medical billing. You will basically, this is going to be um, a, a pers you know, it's going to be a why you should work with me kind of book. Um, you know, there's, there are some pretty stupid things um, that doctors do. Um, they're paying way, way too much in taxes. Um, they don't negotiate things. So um, this is, you know, this is just a pretty exciting book. It's a short little book, short and sweet book about problems to avoid. So like if you went to your doctor and you said, doctor, I want to be healthy. What should I be doing? Your doctor would probably say like, don't smoke, you know. Don't drive without your seatbelt. So these are like nine basic don't things so doctors can optimize their financial health. 
Yeah, and 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 so for a for a marketing tool, it doesn't get any better than this, folks, because you're giving the doctor, uh, first of all, a gift, something that's valuable, has information that they want. Content marketing is how you could refer to this, and it's ingenious because. Again, with your name, uh, we didn't allow for it here on this uh, mock-up here of the cover, but your name will be at the bottom there as having written the forward to this book as well. Folks, this is all included in your license fee. This is a part of what you are paying for when you come to our training and go through our uh, workshop here in, in Dallas. But the are you serious, is, Patrick? Really? What's that? Uh -huh. I, th I thought that was an add-on. That's part of it? Yeah, well, I didn't even tell you about this. We just uh, decided last week to start just including this as a part of the package. We're going to give copies of this to the licensees as a part of their package, 25 copies, yeah. And then they can reorder more of them. By the way, even though I think this one's going to sell for about the same price, about $20 on Amazon, uh, you're able to buy these books at our printing cost, which I think is around $4. $4, that's a, that's a pretty good giveaway for a, a business person as a, a, a marketing tool, especially since it has your contact information in there. And I think I just showed this earlier. Let me put it back up on the screen there. But this is uh, this is basically how we teach it in the classroom. We open up these books and literally take a highlighter and highlight certain passages from Dr. Ragnar and myself. And then we put those little uh, tabs on there so that when you hand this to a doctor, it's not just a book. Uh, Dr. Vicky, I don't, you probably never received a book like this when you were a doctor, but uh, had you never, been no. a book? Could you possibly throw this in the trash without looking at what those tabs are for? <laughs> no, the answer is no. I mean, the, the average person is going to read and flip through those. And, and Dr. Vicky, we've had doctors say that all they did was put it on their desk. They know they're not going to read the whole thing, but they'll flip through it. And especially since we've marked it. And when they read some of these quotes, some of them have called our licensees back up and said, hey, I did not realize that I probably have this problem that's in your book that you mentioned. So can you come in and do that free practice analysis? And that's what we teach our, our licensees to do.